Good morning, Norris. How are you? Hey, good morning, Bernard. I haven't called you Nardo yet, but what's up, Nardo? Well, I appreciate you coming on and spending some time with us this morning. You've got a great story to share with us, and I'm very anxious for you to be able to tell it to everybody. And as you and I have talked in the past, I kind of rotate my weeks on these interviews. We do, I'll have a lawyer on one week, then I'll find somebody interesting in the community. And just from our recent interactions over the last few months, you certainly have got a great story and life lessons to share with us. And for folks who don't know you, give us a little bit of your background, Norris. Well, first of all, my real background, and more than anything else, I'm Norris Thomas from Dothan, Alabama, 806 North Herring Street. Right down the street from my good old friend, we just talked about him, Larry Roberts, but Herring and Herring Street, lived in, was born in Dothan, and went to Girard Elementary School, went to Montana Street, and then over to Girard Middle, you know, got to play football, you know, seventh, eighth grade there, and eighth grade, we moved away back in 82, and moved to Milwaukee, Wisconsin, so and then from there, you know, finished high, went to high school in Milwaukee, went to UW, University of Wisconsin at La Crosse, and, you know, played football along the way, and, you know, had an opportunity to try out with the New York Giants, and played up in the Canadian Football League up until 95, and so from there, lived in Minneapolis up until 2000. Now I live out here in Phoenix, majored in broadcast. I continue to work in broadcast with Fox Sports Arizona, host a show out here called Arizona Prep Spotlight, and when I'm not doing that, if that's not busy enough, I travel the country as a speaker and author in Norris Town of Seminar. Well, Norris, I, if you'll look, I don't know if you can see it from where you are, but I just posted <laughs> our 1979 Colts football team photo. Uh -oh. <laughs> and I, I circled me and you. I think I, I found you in there. But I just wanted to, to show you uh, that from way back in the day. And there's a whole bunch of folks you may recognize in the photo from, from back in, oh, in, in those days. Those were fun days back then. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I remember, you know, you were, we were on the Red, the Superfoods Redskins first together. That's right. And, That's right. You know, you, you wore jersey number 74, which I always thought was really odd. Holy smokes. And, what a and, memory. And, and you didn't have, you know, our the equipment, you had bigger equipment because you were bigger than everybody. <laughs> so you couldn't find. You're being kind. <laughs> but, oh yeah. You were studying like. They had to cinch up your pants with a green belt. <laughs> you know, so it's like, that this guy is just massive. How are we, you know, you're supposed to tackle him? Yeah. <laughs> well, Norris, I know that, that at some time in middle school, you left Dothan and right. you headed north. And that really, at least in my mind, I certainly don't want to speak for you, but in my mind, that really set you on a different path from the time period when you were living in the Dothan area. Right. And I know that, that you have spoken around the country and, and you have such great life lessons to now share because I, I'm so proud of where you are and all the awesome things that you do, but it hadn't come easy for you. And I'd, I'd love for you to share a little bit of your story with the folks to, to show where you came from and, and where you've gotten to. And I think it's very important to, to hear this. Sure. Well, you know, here's the thing, you know, we, <clears throat> my mom, you know, and, and some of the people, some of you who's ever listening in, uh, you may remember my stepdad, uh, Bobby Davis. He was actually became. He ended up working as a custodian at Northview High School for quite some years after we left. But you know, you know, things happen in life. You know, divorce and and so on. And so when we left uh, Alabama, uh, we ended up moving to Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And so you know, really the plan was to kind of go there and and stay with this family for about two or three years. And you know get on our feet, you know, you're just starting all over from scratch, coming from Dothan to the big city, you know, Milwaukee, and, and um, you know, right away things kind of went sideways. But uh, even before that, you know, we talked a little bit about the whole football thing. And so my, my, my goal or my dream to, was to play football in the National Football League. And part of that was I never knew my, my, never knew my biological father. So one of the things that was driving me behind that was, I, I thought that, hey, if I could make it to Monday Night Football and get on television and make a big play, that I was going to call out to my father, my, 
my biological father. And uh, so away we went on this trek, this journey. And so it was more than just, you know, what was happening with, you know, the family, but there was also this thing inside of me that was driving me. And so uh, we couldn't have been in, in Milwaukee more than, geez, two weeks. We left at the end of November. So uh, the, day, the day was December 7th, 1982, you know, which is kind of synonymous with Pearl Harbor. Um, December 7th, so 41 years to the day, we experienced the Pearl Harbor. Uh, the people we were staying with uh, put us out because my mom had got a job cleaning rooms uh, in a hotel room and found a dead body. And uh, the lady just that we were staying with kind of freaked out on her. And she says, you act like you've never seen a dead body before. I'm like, well, that's not something that's kind of normal. I mean, you can find a quarter on the ground. That's a normal everyday thing. Yeah. You know, you might even find a hundred dollars. That's kind of that could happen too. But uh, it kind of it it set us on set us back. You know, and and in that moment, uh, you kind of make a decision. In that moment of okay, are you going to stay in this situation, or how are you going to get yourself out of it? And so for me, um, as crazy as it sounds, here you are. You've made this decision when you're eight years old or nine, playing football, and now you've got to really decide make this decision again. So that first night in the homeless shelter, I put my head on the pillow and I says, well, God, I guess we'll have to make it to the NFL from here. And from there, you kind of just, you go through this process. We're in this family shelter. Uh, I'm kind of embarrassing to, you know, be a part of something, being in that, you know, you're 13, you remember 13, that's the toughest peer pressure age. Um, you know, so uh, we were staying in the shelter. I was, we were over enrolled in school and, um, didn't want anybody to know about that, but I something in you know in that process during those weeks that we stayed in that in that homeless shelter um, is where pretty much the base of the, what I talk about is where I had a revelation about you know what if I could make it out of this I will spend the rest of my life telling the story. So really, you know that moment brought brought us to this very moment right now because of a decision that I made as a, you know, not just as a year, but even again, a reaffirming decision. And I had to continually make over and over again when things got bad and they got bad. Um, how bad do you really want, you know, to have that kind of success now? Ultimately, is the National Football League a measure of success for what you did? Yeah, it, it, you could say that, but there was more driving behind that. And a part of it too was, I just, I never knew my father. So I, I, I wanted so bad to find him. So you know, coupled with, you know, coupled with the fact now, part of it too was I was chasing a championship. I was chasing that 1985 championship team from Northview High School on the gridiron because, you know, I felt so bad. I used to keep in, I would keep in contact or keep tabs at O'Shaw and McGree back in Dothan every once in a while. And then I found out you guys, you know, of course, Northview won it in 81. Then to find out you guys won it in 80, you know, come back in 85 that year and I knew I would have been on that team. And so it really just, that was something else that kind of just pushed me along. And so, you know, moving to the to the North from the South, you know, I was a 165 pound linebacker and I was all conference. <laughs> so <laughs> what does that tell you about, you know, guys are like, man, man, you, you just play different than everybody. I says, man, it's all about Bama. <laughs> you know, I had so much, as I, was, I had so much Bama in me that, I was different, you know, I was just a different dude. Well, Norris, uh, thank you for, for sharing those thoughts. I know that, uh, well, I don't know, because I didn't live that that life that you, you did, that you're describing. But as a, a teenager, 11, 12, 13 year old, um, those are tough enough years as it is for the, the average child, the normal kid just processing life, but then, adding the, the stigma of, of you and, and your mom living in that shelter, I'm sure that just compounded things. And right. probably from a mental standpoint, it, it I would assume, just knowing how well you're, you've you've come this, thus far, it, it's probably made you pretty mentally tough over the years. Well, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, without, I mean, there, you know, I, I'm not gonna sit here, I'd be remiss to say it takes faith and, you know, you've heard the old term, you know, blind faith. There ain't no such thing as blind faith. There's just faith. You know, sure. that's what faith is. It's, you know, and so you, you know, to, 
in that situation to kind of, you know, I want to say you, you kind of challenge God on this thing, you know, okay, hey, you know what, I guess I'll have to just make it to the NFL from here. You, you, you know, this, this, these are the kind of decisions that people that, you know, that's the challenge that I put to my audiences when I'm speaking is, okay, here's a 13 year old kid. And this is quote unquote, the, the elephant in the room. You know, they talk about the picture that doesn't match anything about your circumstances. And do you have the wherewithal to, you know, lock in to something else bigger than what's going on? Can you put that, you know, put your circumstances aside and really stay, you know, find that one thing. And so, you know, I, I had this thing, I'd say, your why defines your try. Well, I had one heck of a why, and it was going to require one heck of a try in that circuit, in that moment. Now, from there, you still have to go through the process. It doesn't mean it's just going to happen overnight, and you're going to have a lot. I, you know, there were other things that came along the way that, you know, you know, before I put my name on a contract in the National Football League, it, you know, it was it wasn't easy sailing at all. But what I tried to you know, you have people do is, you know, there's, there's a system to the madness and I had to kind of re rework and look back. Okay. What was it then that when I've had successes in my life, is there a formula? And I couldn't, Annette, uh, you know, I, for, when I first started going out and speaking, I used to tell the story about being homeless, not knowing my, you know, well, I really, it was just being homeless and wanting to play in the National Football League. Well, not everybody can relate to that, okay? Right. Right. Um, so what I learned, to, what I figured out was, okay, what are some takeaways from this talk? Because that's what people want to know. I mean, people love talking to former athletes. I don't think they always listen, but they like to talk to <laughs> us. So I wanted to make sure that we had some takeaways in my talks that they could apply to help them in any situation, whether you're a sales guy, whether you're, you know, going through personal things and this and that. Here are some things that when I was at my best, when things got bad and when, when I was at my best, what were they? And, you know, so, you know, you talk about this decision as a 13 year old with your head on the pillow. And now we have what we call adult learners or we're adults now. Um, I listened to this guy, Miles Monroe. Uh, he's passed away since. Uh, he talked, I listened to him back in, I want to say 1994. And he talked about the fact that you have to go out and do the thing, the one thing that life and maturity is choked out of you. You get what I'm saying? Chase that thing. And a lot of times, you know, we, I'm sure you know, I know, we all know guys that probably had a lot more talent than we did, but you still push through. And part of it is, is, you know, life, things in life happen where you end up at, you know, how many guys do we know that had to get a job that couldn't make it to practice because mm -hmm. maturity choking that dream out of you. But if you can lock back into that thing, the one thing in your gut that won't let you go. And for me, it was chasing that, chasing that, that NFL dream and, you know, really chasing my father, chasing it, not, not knowing my father. And when that, it, it sounds like that was, the, or those were the motivating factors that got you through middle school got you through high school. I know you eventually signed and, and played a very successful college career that I want to ask you about. And, and I don't want to spoil the, the, the end of the story that you've alluded to, but I want you to share with us a little bit, if you would. Tell me about, tell us about your mindset going through those high school years. And, and you certainly had the athletic talent, but it's not just about talent to get to the next level. What, what, what is it that, share with us that come in some of your secret sauce, if you will, what got you there? Where'd you go? Well, here's the thing, you know, the first thing you have to have focus and everybody's heard of focus, but there's more than just, you can't, you can't just have focus. You have to have sharpened focus to where there is, you know, there is just this one thing that you're going after, you know, and I think. You know, I don't want to go way off on a tangent, but, you know, I think that's what's intriguing about the National Football League. I mean, like Super Bowl Sunday is an important day. I don't know why. It's almost like a national holiday, but it is. Sure. Why? Because I think innately we wish that we could have one thing that we could be focused on. I mean, if people are probably listening to this right now and you've got 
three other things you're just going through your mind that you need to go work on. But, you know, if you can get sharp and focus on that one thing where, you know, there's one thing out there, I think that was the first part for me. You know, it got to a point to where, now I never got any NFL tattoos. I think that was <laughs> that would be crazy and insane. They, um, but, you know, it got to a point to when I was in, you know, when I was in college, when I would lay back on the bench press, I would find a, you know, you've got the ceiling drops and you got these little lines, the grids of the ceiling and the weight room where right in the little square where they would butt up, I would put an NFL logo up there. That was, that was my visualization is that mm -hmm. NFL logo. Everything, everything that I did was pointed to that NFL logo. Okay. So, you know, I had to get sharp and focused. Nothing was going to shake me off of that. Then I had to be disciplined. You know, it's just doing the same, doing things the right way, the same way every day. Mm -hmm. You know, from there, you know, I had to have a plan. You got to have a plan, you know, so what, you know, what did that look like? Well, you, you decide at eighth grade what, you know, what you want to have happen for yourself. And then thing you have to look around and be conscious of, are we making progress towards that? Now for me, Nard, you know, we, I was able to, you know, I made the most of my situation. You know, it's one thing I could have, you know, kicked rocks and been mad at the world and, and said, you know what, this, this Milwaukee thing isn't going to work. We're going to pack up. I'm going back to Dothan, you know, but my brother, my brother, Mark and myself, you know, we made, it wasn't even about making the most of the situation. We lived in the moment. And, mm -hmm. you know, so all of the things that needed to happen, A, from eighth grade up to high school or through, you know, through high school ha happened. I was an all-conference linebacker. I was an all-American track and field guy indoor for the hurdles. We were a part of three state championship track teams at my high school, mm -hmm. you know. And, you know, just absolutely dominated. So to me, you know, what was great about that is, in my mind, that's what most resembled Dothan. That, that championship pedigree was already ingrained in me. So it wasn't like I was just starting this thing all over again. I knew what it felt like to win because we won a city championship with, out at Westgate Park. So I chased that. And, you know, living back in Dothan in 81, you know, seeing Northview win another one, win their first championship with Larry Roberts, and then, you know, you guys coming back and winning one, even though I wasn't there, it was in me. And so I don't think a lot of kids really understood that fuel where it really came from, you know, besides my own personal motivation. But it all started in Dothan for me. And then I had my own personal things that would have, you know, that kind of propelled through that. So, you know, being a part of a championship program in high school mm -hmm. and then where I went to college, University of Wisconsin Lacrosse is where I played college ball. Um, we had, in 1985, they won the national championship. Well, at that point, I'm a sophomore in high school and one of my track coaches went to school there and he had their championship hat on. Now. I'll just share this with you. Now, back in 1985, you know, there wasn't a lot of anything much going on in the state of Wisconsin. The Packers were horrible. The Badgers were absolutely. And so I just, I think I made a decision and I was like, you know what? If I don't get a scholarship to go play wherever, I'm going to Wisconsin lacrosse. And my reasoning behind it was it looked like Alabama. They had a championship, but that's, that was enough for me. And so we got there and um, became a, a, a football and track All-American, but we also won a national championship in 92, mm -hmm. the Stag Bowl. They only, you know, there's only one championship in Division Three, the Stag Bowl, and we won that. And I was a part of an indoor national championship team for track and field, you know, set the school record in the, the, the hurdles. And so all from one decision. You get what I'm saying? It, it all stems from you know, having sharp and focus, number one. So, you know, you have, there's just some things that you had that I had to do in order to get the attention of the, of the National Football League. And it doesn't matter where you are. I think nowadays people mm -hmm. think, well, if I don't play at Alabama or if I don't play at Troy State, there's a ton of opportunity because if you're good, they'll find you. And for me, my, fortunately, you know, I came out of college. I ran a 4.38 40-yard dash. You know, I was, had like a 37 inch vertical and, you know, so I had the number, I had the numbers that brought 
the scouts to, yeah. you know, the little town in La Crosse, Wisconsin. You, you certainly had the physical gifts, but what I'm hearing from you, and I, and I know that, that in a way that I'm hearing is that it's a, it's a mindset, right. it's a focus, you've got the support of your mom, your brother, maybe other family members, and it really takes all of these things, not just God-given talent, but all of these things, no matter what your background is, no matter if you're the wealthiest guy in the world uh, with all the great clothes, et cetera, or you're somebody who is less fortunate in their circumstances, you don't have to be stuck in that. You've got to, to, to use all that you can to get to, to your goals. And it sounds like after college, I want you to finish, complete your athletic story for us. Sure. Well, you know, it, the, the, I, I can tell you this, you know, one, it's amazing how when you, when you really want something really bad, you've got to kind of, you have to start visualizing and seeing it. And, mm -hmm. you know, one of the things that kind of helped fuel, you know, that the NFL piece for me was the New Orleans Saints started training. Their training camp was in La Crosse, Wisconsin for the oh. years that I was there. Mm -hmm. And so they come up every summer. And so I got, you know, I worked in, I worked in the dorms. I worked out on the field and did different things for them. And, you know, I'd taken summer school classes and, you know, for me, it gave me a chance to be up close, you know, to see mm -hmm. where I was kind of headed, you know? So I think um, when you've got, you know, and this is something I try to share with people, you have to kind of start, see, there's got to start being some productivity towards the goal. You have to see production. And for me, that was a sign when I, because my freshman, it was, they didn't come until my freshman year that summer. But when that happened, I thought that was a sign from God, like, wow, you, you really want me to, <laughs> to like lock in and get an opportunity to do yeah. this. So seeing that, um, you got to look for the signs. And, but it, but, uh, but along with that is, you know, like I had the tools that, you know, like I said, that brought people out to, you know, to come and see me, or, you know, sure. through, through college sure. and so on. You know, it was, I, I can remember my first two letters that I got, you know, they don't do email. They didn't have email back in 19, well, they did, but um, there's no internet, I can tell you that. Um, in 1993, uh, the, the Dallas Cowboys and the Green Bay Packers, uh, my coach called me in the office and he, he, he handed me two letters. He said, I got some mail for you. And I just, I didn't thought it was from my mom or something. It was from the Dallas Cowboys and Green Bay Packers. And I can remember, you know, sitting there with tears in my eyes, just like, wow, you know, because I, I struggled academically my second year of college. So I had to sit out and I went back home and worked in a grocery store and gro worked in a grocery store for a year, you know, so I, I worked in the grocery store and made it back to football before Kurt Warner did. <laughs> <laughs> my story is <laughs> certainly, so, certainly. Certainly. Story. but um so that year you know going home you know by my you know kind of by my own doing part of it was you know you just you kind of immature you know you yeah. i was a pro prospect as a sophomore and and in college and it's kind of went to my head you know it wasn't so much that i didn't go to class you just got to get focused you got to get sharp and focused so i was teetering i could have gone to summer school and been eligible to play but I decided to go home and really get my head right and be serious about what you're there to do. Number one is to graduate. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my, my college coach always used to say this to us, Roger Heron, he's a, in the College Football Hall of Fame now. Um, he used to say, you have better chance of becoming a brain scientist than you do a professional athlete. And I always used to say, well, I, coach, I don't like science all that much. <laughs> but, but he's right. And, you know, to this day, he is more proud of me uh, for what I've become outside of football than anything mm -hmm. else, you know, but he. Well, that's, that's what yeah. I was going to ask you, Norris. Uh, before I get to my next question, I want to give a little shout out. We've got several people watching. You may remember from back in the day, Scott Wynn over in Atlanta, hey. Mark Chambliss down in Dothan, uh, Becky Baker here in, in town. Uh, thank you guys, and if any of you watching live with us have any questions for Norris or for myself, just throw it in the comments section and I'll see that. Uh, or later on, you're certainly welcome to reach out to either either of us. Um, Norris, the, what I wanted to transition to is uh, 
you got to play some years in, in the CFL, and you've got an awesome story that I'll let you share in a minute that has something to do with that photo of your left shoulder. Right. Uh, but ultimately, uh, talk to us about that and, and, and your NFL experience. Well, you know, here's the thing. You know, when I, you know, coming from a Division three school, you've got to be on your A game because, you know, we had a very, I came from a very successful program, um, UW lacrosse at the time, you know, Tom Newberry was a guard. He played in the NFL for a number of years and Joel Williams, some of the people from in Atlanta might be familiar with Joel Williams. He played for the Falcons. He came, he went to UW lacrosse. Uh, he was there some years well before me. I just had dinner with him back in November in lacrosse actually. Um, but very successful. He, he was from Florida and went all the way up to tiny UW lacrosse and made it to the National Football League. So, mm -hmm. you know, there were there were some examples there that showed me that, hey, if I made it, you know, Terry Porter who played an MBA, went to one of those small Division three schools in, in uh, Wisconsin State System, Division three guy, he went to my high school. So really it was him before anything that I, that made me realize, hey, if, not, if I don't get a big time offer, I can stay right here in state, play close to home and just have an opportunity. Um, but, you know, the whole, you know, what is it like to be in a National Football League? It, there's nothing like it. I mean, I don't care, you know, how, you know, how, however you want to spin it, there's nothing like it in the world. It was, you know, after the, you know, after the draft, I, before the draft, the Giants flew me out to New York and I just, I thought that's where I was going to get drafted. They even thought I would, but you know, it was the first year that they shrunk the draft down to, to eight rounds. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, draft day comes and my agent calls me and says, hey, New York is probably going to take you in the next little bit. Make sure you're by the phone. Uh, well, they ended up taking a kicker from Georgia. Uh, Todd was Todd's last, I forget Todd's name, but Todd Peterson. They, they took a kicker from Georgia named Todd Peterson. Mm -hmm. And they took a linebacker out of the University of Miami named Jesse Armstead. Not a bad pick. So not a bad I, pick. Not a bad pick. So I was their number one, their their next priority. I was their top free agent signing mm -hmm. coming out. Um, and I remember, so I had a choice. I had offers that came in as soon as the draft was over. And um, I chose the New York Giants. And I remember picking up the phone and calling my mom. And, you know, I said, Mom, I says, uh, you know, I'm a New York Giant. And, you know, she just was crying out and bawling, you know, and this and that. There's no feeling like um, it's the best of the best. And I'm not talking about just being around the players, but the, the National Football League, are, you know, say what you want to say about the game in and of itself. It is probably one of the best, if not the best, organ, you know, best run organizations around. And they treat you like you are on the team. And that was the thing that I had to learn. It was, I was a New York football giant for the time that I was there. And it was nothing like it. And, you know, they had just run the Super Bowl in 91. So, you know, being in the locker room with Lawrence Taylor, Phil Sims, and, you know, those guys, you know, mm -hmm. that was pretty cool. Irv, um, uh, Irv Cross. Yeah. Irv Cross was a tight end. Irv kind of took mm -hmm. me under his wing, took me out. We, he'd come and get me from the, from the hotel. Come on, Rook. Let's go golf and, you know, we talk Alabama and, you know, of course he played, you know, he knew Larry and, yeah. you know, that was kind of, it was, you know, being in the National Football League kind of reacquainted me with guys from Alabama, with, you know, kind of mm -hmm. took me back to my roots a little bit because so many guys, uh, Kerry Goode was mm -hmm. my strength coach. And so it really kind of, you know, made me feel comfortable to be there. And, and it was just, it was, you know, easily you know, one of the best times of my life. Uh, well, t tell us, Norris, I don't want to skip over this because knowing your background and where you came from, right. from the, I, I want to know, if you will, if you don't mind sharing a little bit, sure. tell us about that feeling when you hung up the phone with management or ownership for, for the Giants and then called your mom. Right. How was that feeling, to be able to call her and tell her that? Well, you know, you know, a lot of people, a lot of guys, you know, they say, if I ever make it, I'm going to buy my mom a house and this and that. Well, my mom never asked me to buy her a house or anything. In fact, I didn't ever make enough money to do it anyway. But she always said that. She says, Norris, if you ever make it, 
sign a contract. I just want you to take me out to a really nice dinner. I just want you to, you know, take me out and let's just have a really great meal and celebrate. So that was what I told her. I says, well, mama, you, we're going to go eat. <laughs> and I was in La Crosse at the time. She had moved at that point from Milwaukee to Chicago. So I made a point about, you know, after rookie mini camp, I came home and I went down to Chicago and there was a place called uh, Rudolph's Barbecue. That's where she wanted to go. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it just warmed my heart. You know, we had ribs. We had more, I ate more ribs and I care to even remember how many ribs we had. But that's probably the best wanted. feeling in the world, wasn't it? It was the best feeling in the world to kind yeah. of, you know, I used to say, my, you know, and my mom, you know, just so you know this, and this is, this is true, you know, the night that, I, the first, my first football game with the Superfoods Redskins, and you were on that team, um, I didn't play much. I was a minimal play guy that year. I didn't get to play a lot. And so we lost, our first game that year, we lost to the Falcons. It was, I remember like, like it was yesterday. And I was on the sidelines, and it was right on the goal line, and they needed to score to win the ball game. And the ball snaps, and you hear this loud crash, boom. I mean, we came off the ball like nothing else. And they scored, and they won the ball game. And so I that night, even though I, I was like, you know, I, I wanted to play ball and everything else, I fell in love with the sound of the crashing of the pads. Mm -hmm. And I went home that night, and I was still – now, this is true. I share this with a lot of people. That night, Bernard, I didn't have my pads in right. I had my knee pads were up underneath my thigh pads the whole game. I didn't put them right until I was in the car <laughs> going back home. Sure, so I'm, sure. I walk in, I still have my, my shoulder pads on, didn't have my helmet on. I sit up on the kitchen counter and I said to my mom, you know what, mom? I want to play in the National Football League. I'm going to play pro football. I told That was the first time I ever mm -hmm. verbally said that to her. Was that How night. old were you? I was eight years old, third so, grade, Gerard Middle School. These are, and, these uh, are fantastic stories. For those of you just yeah. joining us, uh, good morning, Mitch. I, I need to, to for those who, who missed the, the beginning of this, I'm talking with Norris Thomas. Norris is a, a longtime childhood friend from Dothan, where I grew up, and Norris spent several years as a youth. Uh, we're talking about, the topic is the fatherless athlete. And, and Norris, you've been so kind in, in sharing your time and your personal story, telling us where you've come from and, and, and where you've gotten to. And I could not be more proud of, of one of my Dothan guys uh, from what you're doing. But And we've got just a few more minutes before we wrap up. But there's two things that I definitely, before we get finished, I want you to share with us. And and the theme that, one of the other themes that I'm hearing from you is is always, always having focus, always having that dream, not letting things, obstacles in life get away from you. And over your left shoulder, there is a fantastic story that you need to share. I'd love for you to share about that photo and, and how you got there. And then I want you to tell us how we can get in touch with you and those kind of things uh, okay. when you get finished, okay? But tell us, sure. definitely tell us about that story. Well, you know, you in, in life, you know, the, the, it's chasing the dream or whatever, if you want to call it that. I tell people this all the time. The thrill of the chase has to be greater than the thrill of the capture because ultimately we know what our goals are. OK, we know that if I do X, Y, Z, I'm going to get this result. OK, but don't fall in love with the end because you kind of know what that is. Fall in love with the capture. So that picture over my shoulder kind of represents my chase. I mean, do you know how many times I've run 100 yard sprints, wind sprints over and over and over and over and over and over again? And I was a defensive back, so we don't get to, it's not like I got to touch the ball a whole heck of a lot once I got to college or even in the pros for that matter. But what, you know, the, the story behind that was, you know, I, well, I can finish this up. I got to play in a couple of preseason games. I was a next to the last cut with the Giants in 93. And so the next year I went back to school, finished up my degree, got a job in broadcast, and I get this phone call from the Winnipeg Blue Bombers in the CFL. And I'm thinking, well, you know, why don't we just go up there and do that? Hopefully I'll get a shot back in the National Football League. Well, I go up and uh, I make the team and, you know, the season gets going. Initially, they put me on the practice squad. Then they activate me. Well, you know, it's one of those things of how bad do you really want it? And, you know, 
So the day of that, that, of that game, we were going to play the Toronto Argonauts on the road. So the day before the game, I was suited, I was slated to dress out for the game. So they said, hey, make sure tomorrow you pack your bags, you're going to Toronto with the team. I get to the airport that morning, the next day, and they says, well, we decided we're going to play somebody else. You need to, you know, just go back. I mean, it was, a, a, it was very, very embarrassing. I was pretty much heartbroken because at this point, um, you know, I'm ex I was at the time I was expecting my first child and I'm like, OK, if I'm not making game checks, how am I going to take care of this? my daughter that was going to be born and so on? And I'm freaking out. So I'm mad at the world wanting to give up. Seriously, I went back to my apartment. I called my agent. I'm like, hey, guys, you know what? These guys, you know, I got to you got to get me out of here. And at that time, the CFL season starts so much earlier than the National Football League. It was still mm -hmm. Early enough to where I could have caught on and camped somewhere with the league. So just get me out of here, you know. And I had a contract up there, so it's not like you just can walk away. You don't do that. But I get I get back to my apartment and you know I start packing. I was done. I was in my head. I was figuring I'm not I'm not staying here. And I get a phone call at about I want to say no, you know it was the it was the next day of the game. I get a phone call. No, no, it was that same that afternoon late. I get a phone call and they said, hey, um, somebody got hurt during practice that, and you, 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 we have a plane ticket at the airport. You need to come. So I, you know, I catch this red eye flight out of Winnipeg over to Toronto, which is like three time zones over. <laughs> I show up. And the next morning, you know, I said, hey, you're going to meet with coach in the lock, you know, meet him in his hotel room and he'll go over your assignments for what you're going to do. All I was going to do was just go and run down on kickoffs. That was what I was just a backup. I was going to just be a special teams guy. And either way, I had to stop myself in that moment and realize, wait a minute, I'm about to play my first pro game. So I'm excited. I mean, like I'm taking I taking pictures of my locker, my uniforms there, Thomas across the jersey, the whole thing, man. It was just, you know, everything. I Because one of the things that I learned um, in the National Football League when I was there, and I, I watched Jesse Armstead, the way he performed in camp, you know, and being in New York City, I always look like this. You have one opportunity to impress, and you need to be on your A game. And I think I had done that to that point in Winnipeg. And so... I realized I wasn't going to miss out on this moment. So I'm snapping pictures and, you know, just soaking up the moment because, uh, you know what, maybe I'll play a lot, maybe I won't. So we, uh, they kicked the ball off to us in the second half and I catch it and I just take off and untouched 97 yards. No, I mean, when I say untouched, I mean, no one laid a hand on me and, you know, the guy who, I don't know who, you know, whoever the lead guy is that snapped that picture, it's just, so perfect because let me look on the back here because the uh, that big little target thing in the back of it is almost like you know when I saw that picture it made me think you've got to you have to have faith and sometimes you just have to run to the target and you may not know where that target is but that that thing over my shoulder is like it just for me it was how many times have I run how many times have you pulled yourself off the mat how many times have you not given up? If I would have gave up, guess this, what if I would have got on that plane to Minneapolis and just left town? That never would have happened. I, I mean, I don't even, I mean, would we still have the same story? Probably not, you know? So that in and of itself says never, no matter what the circumstances, never give up because all of the training that you do is preparing you for one moment. All it takes is just one moment in time mm -hmm. to change your whole life. And that's what that is. That shows me to never, ever, no matter what the circumstance, to give up. Well, Norris, I appreciate you sharing that awesome story. I was looking forward to hearing that. And for the, for folks who don't know you, um, you now have children who have uh, competed in the SEC. I know your daughter just graduated maybe last year uh, from Bama, played volleyball very successfully. And you've got some up and coming superstars in the house uh, playing ball in different parts of the country. And I, I just, I could not, I can't stress enough just how uh, pleased I am that you were able to share your story with us and tell us 
um, your 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 themes and and those those things that are so very important to you that are just incredible life lessons and, and goals and and to to not ever let go of your dreams. Uh, for folks who want to get in touch with you, I know that you speak quite often. Uh, you're an author. Uh, you're also on uh, Fox Sports. Is it Southwest uh, in South in Fox Arizona? Sports. Uh, folks, who, and we'll put this in the comments section after. I'll put all your, your contact information if that's okay. But right. tell folks how they can get in touch with you and, and what you do uh, for a living professionally now. Sure. Well, you know, I when I when I retired from football and basically after 95, 96, I, I had an opportunity to speak at a school. And I, I knew that being in broadcast or being an athlete or former athlete that guys did it. So I got my... I did my first speaking thing. And now I was, I was that guy growing up that was the public address announcer at high school. I did the morning announcement. So I've always had this gift that's run my mouth. Okay. So, <laughs> you know, you, you know, aside from the football stuff, I knew that's what I want to major in broadcast. And so um, my first talk was at this elementary school and this lady came up to me from in the audience. She said, Oh, your story was great. You know, what's your fee? And I looked at it. I'm like, what do you mean? What's my fee? I was, <laughs> I was standing there, my, my pay for that day was a cup of Tootsie Rolls. <laughs> so, and at that point, I'm like, wait a minute, I should be getting paid for this stuff. You know, because I just thought I needed to be a Hall of Famer. I needed to be like a Lou Holtz or whatever, those types of guys to get to make money or, you know, however it was. So this is in 96. And so from there, I started kind of peeking around and just asking people, hey, you need a speaker for this and that. And so we developed Norris Thomas seminars back in 1996 and really just, you know, started out telling this story, the story of being, you know, overcoming the homelessness and so on and so forth. But it has evolved into, you know, a couple of things where we branch out. We kind of talk about the fatherless athlete. And, and, and so I've had colleges bring me in. Um, I spoke at a conference in Orlando with athletic directors and support staff about that very issue because it's a huge issue. In fact, Bernard, you know, it was one of the topics that came up in both pro locker rooms with the New York Giants. And I, I didn't bring it up. And when I was in the Canadian Football League, there's guys. And I'm not just talking about fathers. And when, once I became a coach, I found out that there were guys that had dads that basically, you know, they were going home fighting with their dads. You know, so it's a it's a huge issue in the sports world, not just, you know. And then I found out, you know, doing corporate presentations and talking about it. People were coming up to me. These are accomplished people with PhDs and, and published that says, you know, I had a terrible experience with my father or I didn't have a father. And so I found kind of a niche um, along with, OK, what you were asking me about is, you know, what is, you know, so, the, you know, what is it that I can give to people when I'm talking to them? Well, I go back to, you know, how do you overcome that or how do you become a better salesperson? Well, I got the five characteristics of a successful decision which dates back to being 13 years old. You gotta mm -hmm. get sharp and focused. You gotta have clarity and mission. You gotta be disciplined. You're gonna see increased results and then you're gonna get to mastery, which is winning. And we all have to decide what winning is individually. So if you visit my website, norristhomas.com, that's the way you can reach me. Um, there's you know a couple of, what, there's a video on there about the, talking about my book in his image, Fatherless to Fatherhood. You know, it chronicles my journey from Dothan you know, you know, from that into, you know, of course, not knowing my father, which I'll give you a little sneak into the book. I eventually found my dad at the age of 30. And uh, it's a great book. And it's also a call of action in there, because I think really, Bernard, we all outside of our four walls, even if we are fathers or, or not, we have a responsibility to society to take a fatherly role in helping people around us. Well, Norris, I could stay talking with you all day long, but I know you've got a lot of a lot of things you got to get done, and I sure appreciate all the folks who who watched us live. Uh, of course, you can reach out to Norris afterward. Uh, we'll put it again in the comments section. But it's so good to hear from you and and to chat Absolutely. with you for a bit and sharing your your story and life lessons, uh, guys. This will conclude us for the day. Uh, again, this is Nomberg Law Live. We come to you every Tuesday at 10 o'clock Central. Uh, this was a real treat, Norris, today. I appreciate it. No, Guys. It, was a, it was an absolute honor, and now I'm going to mess with you for a second. You know, Bernard, your dad and you, you guys, your family, you guys were my one of my first heroes. 
growing up. You were you were absolutely one of my heroes growing up. And uh, your father, you know, Joel, just a absolute, you know, a, he was what we he was what I strive to be. And uh, you know the way he was with you coming up, but you definitely were a hero of mine, childhood friend, but more so a hero because you you just did things the right way. And I'm so pr I'm so proud of you, and it's been an honor to be a part of this today. Well, thank you, Norris. Those are very kind words. I'm not sure if Dad is still watching, but I know he was watching you earlier in the interview, and I'll certainly share your your kind words with him. Uh, guys, we'll be back next week uh, with the onset of of spring baseball going on. You know my love of the sport. Uh, we hope to uh, talk with the folks, uh, uh, Skip uh, Watkins, who is the executive director of the Friends of Rickwood Field. Rickwood Field is the oldest active baseball field in America. We happen to have it here in our backyard in Birmingham, and I'm very much looking forward to talking with Skip. Uh, this will conclude us for the day, and we hope you guys have a good rest of your week. Take care. Bye-bye.